Good evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Fridley, Fridley. co-director of education at Maddie's Fund. Tonight's webcast will focus on adult cat and kitten fostering with Christina Elwood and Jody Osborne. Christina joined uh, Charleston Animals uh, Society in 2010 and while attending college, so she had two jobs. Having earned a degree, her years with CAS ignited her passion for the animal welfare field and she knew that this was where she belonged. Christina started as an adoption counselor, making advancements through the years until set it, settling into her current role as foster and rescue coordinator. She's been in, instrumental in making the foster program a huge success, especially in the past few years as foster numbers have skyrocketed. Jody Osborne, foster and rescue coordinator, began her tenure with Charleston Animal Society as a volunteer in 2005. She volunteered almost every day for the next few years, and her efforts paid off with an offer of employment in 2007. After working in several roles over the years, she accepted the position of Foster and Rescue Coordinator, and since that time has increased the foster program at CAS tremendously, aiding in the su success of the No Kill Initiative. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping items. Take a look at the left side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you'll ask questions during the presentation. Please get your questions in early. Questions submitted late in the presentation may not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help but a button at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours, should you wish to view it again. Jody and Christina, thank you for being here tonight. All right. Thanks, guys. Christina here. I am just going to apologize for my voice ahead of time. I'm getting over a cold, but I hope you can understand me. And here's Jody. Hi, I'm Jody. Thank you so much for having us here. I'm still a little nervous doing these. However, I hope you enjoy the talk. All right. Well, I'm going to start off and... Um, I'm going to start off with um, some just some general information about our shelter here in Charleston, just so you get a frame of reference of where we are. Um, so we are a private shelter, um, but we do have a contract with our county. Um, we are open admission um, and have one single location. We have around 100 employees um, on a good day and about 300 active volunteers and uh, usually anywhere between six and 700 um, foster families. Um, our total intake for 2017, um, you can see 9,439, um, with uh, 3,735 being dogs, um, over 5,000 cats, and 281 others. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so the foster numbers for 2017. So we sent out 2,523 animals to foster, um, and as you can see, the majority of those were cats. Uh, so that's why we're going over the cat and kitten foster program. Um, we do send out dogs here as well, but definitely cats um, definitely is our, our most, um, the thing that we send to foster most. Um, and just our live release rate for 2017 was at 90%. Um, I do want to mention with a little picture of our staff here, you know, a foster program, like one of the, the main things you need is you need the backing of all of your staff at the shelter. So. If you're still having trouble with, you know, even getting your staff on board, you know, it, it's important to have them there. So um, we will go ahead and move on, and I think we got some questions here. Yeah, we have our first poll question of the night. So um, I want you out there in audience land to answer on your screen. Do you currently have a cat and kitten foster program? Click yes, no, or not applicable. So, do you currently have a cat and kitten foster program? Answer on your screen, and we'll give you just a second longer, and we'll go to the results. Wow. Whoa, those are big numbers. What do you think, Estrina? <laughs> um, that's awesome. So, good. The majority of y'all actually already have a, a foster program, so that's awesome. Um, hopefully, we can just help you build it out then here today. And we have another poll question. What are your biggest challenges within your foster program? 
you may select more than one answer. Recruiting new foster homes, retaining foster homes, long and difficult foster application process, supplies and medical, or other. Please answer on your screen. What are your biggest challenges within your foster program? Select more than one answer if you'd like to. And we will go to the results. Recruiting is the top one, Christina. Wow, yeah, 92% um, need help recruiting new foster homes. And we're go, definitely going to go over that. And then I see that retaining is also um, a difficult one for you guys. So we'll definitely go touch base on both of those in this, uh, in this webinar. And one more fact-finding poll question. How do you currently recruit your foster homes? You can also select more than one answer. Um, Walk-ins, word of mouth referred by other foster families, off-site events, social media, TV, radio, or other. How do you currently recruit your foster homes? Select all that apply, and please answer on your screen. And here's the results. Word of mouth and social media seem to be the top ones. Oh, wow, yeah, word of mouth, okay. And social media definitely is a big one. So, um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and go into, actually right into talking about um, recruitment here. So foster recruitment, there are lots and lots of ways to recruit foster homes. Um, one of our major ones is social media, and um, I'll go over that just a little bit. Um, but, you know, there's also TV and radio um, in your area. You can put ads in newspapers. Um, flyers, um, you know, can hand out flowers, flyers at events, um, and definitely word of mouth. Um, you know, if, if the people are having a good experience, um, then they're going to tell their friends, their neighbors um, about it, and, um, you know, you'll get definitely a lot uh, more foster homes that way. So going into it a little bit more, so social media. Um, <clears throat> Facebook is definitely our biggest um, way that we can recruit new foster homes. Um, and we happen to have a big following on Facebook, which is lucky for us. Um, we have over 250,000 likes on Facebook. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a far reach for us. Um, one of the best ways to get more likes on Facebook, um, or even really any of your social media, is to tell, to tell stories. So we did have a big story here with Caitlin, the dog, whose uh, muzzle was, uh, was wrapped in electrical tape when she was found. Um, and so when we told her story, that's when our, our Facebook kind of grew tremendously and we got more likes and our reach got further. Um, a, a lot of those people are from other states, so not necessarily all of them are going to be your foster families, but you might, you know, get a lot more in your area as well. So I think telling stories, it's important to tell stories, you know, even though it may be sad, like Caitlin's story was obviously really sad. Um, the pictures were horrific, but it's important, I think, for the people in your area to know what you're doing here at the shelter. Um, they love to know, you know, the stories, the different things that come into the shelter. Um, you know, so we're also on Instagram. Um, we've started doing that recently with posting pictures on there. And we have a small following on Twitter. That's something new that we're starting. But kind of all of our stuff from Facebook goes directly to Twitter. So that's a good, like, correlation there um, that you can set up. But with all of your social media, um, it's actually pretty important that you use hashtags. Like, I know it probably sounds a little bit silly, um, and sometimes people think that they're silly, but they actually do work in helping you um, gain more likes and for people to see more of the things that you are putting out there. Um, so we have some simple ones like hashtag adopt at CAS, or even just hashtag foster. If you get a second, you know, go on to Google and you can type in like hashtag foster, hashtag adopt at CAS, and you can see what all that's, you know, connected to out there on the Internet, and it really does help you get some new people in. So um, oh, this, I'm going to hand it over to Jody. She's going to take it over from here. 
Thanks, Christina. Another way for our shelter is to recruit more foster families is doing a kitten and puppy shower each year. So a lot of shelters are unable to do this, but you can throw it at your in the lobby of your shelter. We started in 2015. Uh, it's coincided with our opening of the kitten ICU unit. And this is open to the public, our fosters, our donors, and our volunteers. Each year, uh, we have hosted the annual shower around May and April. We found this is the best time to do so when the kitten's starting to come into our facility, as well as the adult cats. Uh, we found it's also a great way for foster parents to interact with one another. And another thing that we do is we promote it on with our foster supply on Amazon list. So if you have a wish list, you can promote it that way, get your donations in that you need. In the pictures, you'll see that we set up a little area with rocking chairs. We had all our supplies built in there, and we kept it up for about a week or so. Also, kittens are, and cats are available for foster that day, and the attendees may choose which kittens they would like to foster. For our kitten intensive care unit, which was built in 2015 and actually used to be our retail store. Um, we, it's the first room that the visitors see when they first walk in to our adoption lobby. We have six incubators that are set up for kittens that are bottle fed, winged, as well as nursing moms, and occasionally the injured cats that have a broken leg. It's similar to a nursery, so they, the visitors can see it through the window. They're not allowed to enter. However, sometimes we will take people in there to see if they're interested in fostering and talk to them one on one. Our humane education, oh, sorry about that. Our humane education is another way that we recruit foster homes. The children and animals, they have a natural bond. Our humane educators at Charleston Animal Society, they're in classrooms each week. They're teaching elementary school, middle schools, and high school students. One of the topics that they discuss is foster care. We tell the children to go home and talk to their parents about the secret that they've learned in class called fostering, and it works great. Each year we have the spring, summer, and winter camps for the children of all ages. They are anywhere from two days to a week of learning all about the aspects of humane education for caring for animals to learn about veterinary medicine and foster care. We also have youth groups that are another way that we reach out to our foster families to reach out to children. The groups such as Girl Scout, Brownies, and Boy Scouts come to the shelter with some donations and they learn more about the animals and they also receive a badge. And the word of mouth, that's our biggest recruitment, at least in my opinion. If you have a great experience, you're going to tell somebody about it. You're going to talk to them. And you're going to let everybody know. Our foster application, as you can see, is very short and simple. It's non-judgmental and it's open and easy. We have found that based on open-ended questions, it's the best practice when obtaining information for potential foster families. Our one requirement is that the foster parents must be 18 years and older. This has opened up multiple opportunities for single families as well as young adults that are in college to foster. Our shelter does not perform home visits or veterinary references. However, we will ask for their veterinarian's information and their landlord's information as well, just to have it on file. And our foster parents may apply in person or online. This has helped us so much because everybody's on the internet nowadays and they go on, they see the application, they fill it out there and it's emailed to our facility and to Christine and I receive it that day and we'll call them when we have kittens available. With the email, they also receive, or the email they receive tells us them about the application and the different programs that we have at our shelter. All right, so sending out our fosters, we find the our waiting animals that are needing to go to foster homes by posting on social media. We'll do a video, we'll post a little picture, we'll tell the story about the reasons why the animals need to go out. This helps a lot because you get more people involved and they share it with their friends and family. It's also a great way to get out your medical cats and ones that are going through behavior so they're not doing well at the shelter. People can see that they need a foster home. Another thing is knowing your foster families. This is honestly the best thing you can do as a foster coordinator or manager. Know what your foster parents are willing to take and act on that. If you know somebody who loves taking the cats that don't do well in shelters, send them those cats. And emails are another great way to send out mass emails about multiple fosters. So if you have multiple groups of kittens, or multiple cats, you can send out a mass email to everybody. And also phone calls. Now this in day and age, no one wants to pick up the phone and call people, but it's personal and it can be beneficial when talking about certain fosters. It can be time consuming, but it pays off in the long run. All right, and the next question. We have our next poll question. Um, do you send supplies with your foster families? Yes, no, if possible. Please enter on your screen. And I'd like to encourage you to get your answers in early 
we want to save some time at the end of the presentation so that our speakers can get to them. So to please submit your questions. And we'll go on ahead and look at the results. Yes. Wow, 81.8%. Jody. Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. I'm very happy that everybody's able to do that. And some of these who are getting there are the ones that are, if possible, that's still wonderful. All right, so we are going to go into a little video here. We provide everything you need to be a successful foster family. We send you home with a bag of supplies specific for your foster animal. For example, this is one of our kitten bags. So we'll send you home with litter, a litter box, some toys, food for your specific foster animals. So our kittens, our neonatal kittens, will get a kitten milk replacement formula. For our larger wean kittens, you'll be sent home with wet food or dry food, depending on your your kittens needs and we also send you home with things like a thermometer and a scale to make sure that you are marking your kittens progress. We also give you a carrier for your kitten and if you take home a puppy or a different kind of animal we'll give you a crate as well. We want to set you up for success as best as we can. All right so as you can see from that video um, we do send out um, a lot of basic supplies um, that we can. We've actually kind of asked some of our foster parents you know what is a big reason that keeps them fostering um, or why they foster to begin with and a lot of them say you know they love the fact that we are able to supply them with you know, with the things that they need because a lot of people can't necessarily afford to take on another animal so they can't afford that extra food or you know extra supplies at all so the fact that we do supply it is a big benefit um, to the foster program um, we also do some more in-depth supplies for certain um, scenarios so we have a baby bag that we send home with our neonate fosters um, and as you can see that has things like um, bottles or miracle nipples um, there's the kmrs in there we send a scale thermometer uh, petroleum jelly um, gloves alcohol, alcohol pads syringes pedialyte things like that um, that's going to help a neonate um, survive so we found that you know if we're just sending home kmr um, if they start to crash or things like that then they didn't have the supplies that they needed um, and we were having more trips to the emergency vet. So if we supply them and train them a little bit better on what to do if the you know, kitten is crashing, um, then we found that that helps out a lot. We also have um, a program, it's called our EKT program as part of the foster program um, that stands for Emergency Kitten Technicians. Um, so even if it's not necessarily a tiny kitten, but they're just not doing well, um, not eating, um, they're really skinny, and they need fluids, we have we add a little bit to that bag where we will specifically train these fosters to give fluids um, and you know look out for signs of, of a crashing kitten and things like that so we'll put in a few fluids butterfly needles um, and you know the recovery or ad prescription foods and definitely like a heat source and stuff like that so being able to send all of that home with you know critical care kittens has definitely helped us save more lives that way um, instead of you know, them being at the house without any of those specific um, things that they may need. So um, it's great that a lot of you can send supplies home already because it's definitely um, a big plus, uh, I think, for the foster families um, for that. So a foster care guide. Um, it's important to have a pretty good foster care guide. So we actually were able to just redo ours um, in the last couple of years. We had one and it was kind of boring. It was very plain. Uh, with big paragraphs of writing, you know, um, it's, you know, not very user-friendly. Um, I don't think people actually took it home to read it. Um, it probably was just put in a stack somewhere and said, oh, you know, I'll just read that later. Um, but since being able to redo them, you know, they're a lot, they're nicer. There's pictures, there's little things in there um, about, like, tips and tricks and stuff like that, um, you know, little things on the side. Um, and these should actually be, um, I think, in the resources for you to look at um, as well. But we have a couple different ones. And since um, kittens is actually one of our biggest things that we send out, we do have one specifically for orphan kitten care. Um, and it's been helpful to have one specific for that or else our general manual would end up being like 100 pages long. So um, with having one specific, we get to go over important topics um, for them, like how to, you know, even how to set up a room. So in there, there's a little picture of like maybe a bathroom, and it shows them how they should set that up for the kittens. 
Um, it goes into if they have a nursing mom, um, it, you know, kitten neonate feeding, kitten development, um, and maintaining foster health, um, and what to do as far as veterinary care and emergency care, um, and then adoption options. Um, there we do have another one um, for, it's kind of adult cats and dogs in the same one together. Um, so we do a touch on the cats in that one and have a separate one for that. Um, what we have found, though, with the fosters um, having this nicer guide that they may actually read is that they do read it, and we tell them to, uh, to refer to that before necessarily calling us or emailing us um, with all the questions that they may have. So that would help cut down on all those calls and emails for you because they're actually paying attention to what some of those things say in their foster manual. So um, that's been a big plus for us. Um, and we have one more short video. Um, that goes a little bit over veterinary care. When it comes to medical care, we've got you covered. The things we'll do for you include wellness exams, provided every one to three weeks, depending on the age of the animal, vaccinations, deworming, medical testing, behavior evaluations are provided for adult dogs, heartworm and flea prevention, microchips. You also have access to after-hours emergency care. All right, so that was a little video about what we provide um, as far as veterinary care. So as you can see, we do a lot of the basic um, veterinary care here at the shelter um, because we are lucky to have um, our veterinarians here on staff. I know not everybody does, um, but we do provide all of that. And they go through a bunch of stuff before even going out to foster. Um, and as far as our rechecks, um, so we do all of our rechecks here at the shelter as well. So they, the fosters have to bring them here to the shelter to get that done. Um, our rechecks are going to depend on how old the, the animal is or what medical issue the animal might be having. For instance, a neonate under four weeks of age, we would like to see once weekly kittens over like five weeks um, every two weeks or so. Um, but medical cats um, are seen anywhere between one to three weeks, kind of depending on what is going on with them. Um, like, you know, a cat that has a fracture, we might want to see more often. Um, than one who just needs some socialization or something like that. So it really depends on what is going on with them. Um, but what we found is what's important is that to, it, to give all of your fosters a recheck kind of when they are picking up that animal. So instead of saying like, oh, you know, well, we'll just call you later, you know, with the appointment and then maybe, or them saying, I'll call you when I'm available, you know, a lot of times that never gets done and then the animal can get lost in the system and kind of just push to the side. Um, we like to make sure that they have a set appointment, even if they aren't 100% on it. At least we have one in stone, um, and then that's there when they don't, if they don't show up for that one, we can say, oh, this person didn't show up. So um, we like to make sure that we're giving them um, right away, as well as when they're here for each recheck, um, they get a new appointment at that time for the next time to come in. So we don't like anybody to not ever have an appointment because, like I said, those ones get lost sometimes. Um, just for reference, we, for our rechecks, um, scheduling our rechecks, we use a um, software called Full Slate, um, and that has really helped us kind of keep um, track of all of the, the appointments and help us got, um, get organized um, rather than when we used to try like handwritten calendars or like even Google calendars or stuff like that. So that's really been a help for us. So as far as emergency care, um, Emergencies are going to happen. Uh, we know that they are, it's always going to happen, especially the bigger your foster program gets, the more emergencies you're probably bound to get. Um, so that's why you want to make sure that you have a plan in place for that. Um, and so for us, we are here in the building from eight to five every day, um, at the very least, so there's somebody going to be here. So if our fosters have any um, emergency during the day, we just have them go ahead and bring the animal to the shelter here and our uh, veterinarians can take a look at it here. Um, but the, if there are any after hours emergency, so when we're not open from five o'clock to nine to eight o'clock in the morning, um, there is an after hours emergency number that they can call. So that is a cell phone that Jody and I go back and forth with, um, kind of like on a weekly basis um, to have people call. Um, so they'll give us a call if something was going on. And we would find out, you know, if it was something that needed to be seen that day, couldn't wait for the next day, then we do have a contract with our local emergency clinic um, in our area, um, and we can have them taken there. 
Um, luckily, the contract, we do get a little bit of a discount there, um, and they also let us bring some of our own supplies over there um, to help us save a little money as well so they can use our supplies instead of theirs. So that's a plus um, with our uh, e-clinic in the area. Um, but the little picture that you see below, so that is actually in our manual as well. Um, it's one of the last pages in there, and it's the page that we point out the most for fosters when they're taking, especially a new foster family when they're taking some new animals. So that has a list of things that we consider emergencies and things that we, you know, aren't necessarily emergencies, but they're still concerning. Um, and we tell them anything that's kind of like a non-emergency, just give us a call and um, or email us and we'll schedule you an appointment to come in. But any of those emergencies, you know, since the, the phones can be hard to get to, we're not always at our desk, just either bring in the animal or if it's after hours, call that emergency number. So that I think has helped tremendously in cutting down our calls um, on whether something is like an emergency or not. So um, that has been a big plus for us as well. So I know a lot of people are wanting to know how we retain our foster parents. One way is our Facebook group that we have. We started this in 2017. Right now we only have about 150 members. Um, but overall, I know we passed on through the summer, we're going to have three times that. So the closed group is manned by Christina and myself. Our foster parents and staff are the only members. The, foster, the members have to be approved foster parents or ones that are recently just applied and they're waiting to take home animals. We have our staff on there. That way we can also help or have them monitor it. If we don't see something, they can comment on it as well on a post. It's a, also a great way to post your fosters that are waiting to go out. Um, the ones that are letting to know the foster parents know have also sheltered ongoing. So if you're going to be closed for the day, you can let them know. Um, you can see on the page, one of our foster parents, she checks the page 100 times a day waiting for kittens. Or they're always saying that they can't wait to foster again. So the foster parents, they love to talk to one another. We don't discourage it. We encourage it. It's helpful for them to talk to one another, especially if a kitten of theirs or a cat has passed away. They can get the emotional support they need from other foster families that have gone through that experience. Also, a lot of our foster parents like to go out together. We have a cat cafe called Pounce Cat Cafe and Wine Bar. The foster parents will make little dates to go out and to hang out with one another and talk about their ongoing through their life. Our foster brunch and giveaways are another way that we retain foster parents. As you can see in the picture, they receive tote bags, bracelets, t-shirts, and cups. And then we also have bumper stickers for them too. And that's a great way for us to show our appreciation to the foster families. They receive the gifts anytime they come into the foster brunch, or if they miss it, they can come back and get some more. We also try to get sponsors to donate to, to the event to help our shelter save more money to be able to save the kittens and the cats. In the past, we've had it at their shelter. We've had it at the fire museum and also a decommissioned aircraft carrier that's here in Charleston. Anywhere that's in your town that has the ability to host an event, ask them to see if you're, they're available. It's an inexpensive get-together for your most valuable volunteers and supporters. And our foster parents love the t-shirts because they say, proud to be a foster failure. We also sell those here in our lobby, too. Another great way for retention is our Foster of the Year and Foster of the Month. Each year, we celebrate one of our outstanding foster parents that have gone above and beyond for helping a certain litter or a specific animal. Each year, or each time they receive a gift certificate for a restaurant, that we've contacted and asked if they will sponsor it. We do 12 a year, as well as our volunteers too, so that's 24 total. And they get their picture taken for our wall. And our Foster of the Year is acknowledged at the foster staff and recognition party that we have each year. And they receive a small little trophy. And next question. We have our next poll question. Do you encourage your foster families to find homes for their fosters? That would be either a yes or a no. Um, we're nearing the end of the presentation where we'll be ta taking the questions and answers. So, uh, so get your questions in. Uh, do you encourage your foster families to find homes for their families? Please answer on your screen. And we have yes. Over oh, 70%. wow, that's 72%. Yes. That's wonderful. We definitely encourage it here. <clears throat> All right, so speaking of that, um, we have here um, what we call, it's actually our adoption ambassador program, and that's how it started. Um, 
but we found that giving our adopted ambassador program a new name was something that was really big. Um, we changed it, not necessarily we changed it, but kind of called it Operation Whiskers, and people started really getting into the program. They wanted to be a part of whatever Operation Whiskers was, so we had more people wanting to join that um, rather than just calling it our Adoption Ambassador Program. Um, but like she said, we definitely encourage um, our foster families to start looking for homes even when kittens are young. Um, so we tell them, you know, they definitely can't just move into another foster home. You know, they need to stay with you, but go ahead and try and find somebody to adopt them. You know, that way they stay out of the shelter. They're not here, you know, getting sick, you know, getting upper respiratory infections or anything like that. And it's also a good way to, you know, stop from having a backlog of kittens. So before we really launched this program, we used to have a ton of like rollaway cages that we had to put out, um, you know, to keep the kittens in when they were ready for adoption. I mean, we actually, for the first time last year, didn't have to pull any of those cages out with promoting the Operation Whiskers program like that. So um, it's been really successful for us. Um, so basically, they'll just come back to get spayed and neutered, um, and then they'll go right back out, um, sometimes straight to their adoption homes, um, or sometimes the fosters will continue to find a home for them. Um, so that's been really good. Um, basically, the way that they do that is um, we can send them home with what we call their little adoption surveys. Um, and they can fill those, um, have whoever wants to adopt them, fill them out, bring them to us, and we'll attach that to the paperwork of whatever animal they want to adopt. Um, the foster parents don't have to be a part of that at all. They definitely have a choice. Um, we have some foster families who don't want to do it. They say that maybe they don't know a lot of people, they're not big into social media, um, so they decide that it's just not for them. But then we have the ones who are really into it and really have done you know, a hundred kittens and have probably found homes for all of them. So um, it's a it's a program that you can, you know, they can either do or not do. It's definitely they don't have to. So another big way that we keep animals out of the shelter um, is through our business ambassadors. So we work with a lot of businesses um, around the area to help, and they will actually keep animals there at their facility. So we'll place cats and kittens at the pet marts and the pet coast. Um, and we'll do um, some at some of the local veterinary clinics are actually will help us as well. And so like the little cages that you see in the picture, they can set that up. And even if it's one litter, you know, that's one less litter in your shelter. Or if it's one less cat, you know, a dog cat, that's one less adult cat in your shelter. And um, we empower the people that are whoever at that facility um, to learn how to do the adoption and um, do it themselves so that they don't have to like come to the shelter or anything. Um, we also do it in little pet boutiques, um, pet boarding facilities, and we recently um, had a hotel. Um, it's for a dog, but they, um, when building the hotel, they built in a dog run so that they could have a dog from the shelter there as well, um, and they've already done a few adoptions from that hotel, so that was really cool. Um, we, um, so Jody mentioned the pa Pounds Cat Cafe that our fosters go to. Um, well, what's even really cool about that is not only can they go there and hang out, but it's actually we supply all of the cats from the shelter um, from, you know, for we, they, the ones that aren't for adoption come from our shelter. So um, that's really cool. And they've been a big adoption um, ambassador for us. So they have done around 670 cat adoptions just in the first year that they have been open. So that has been really, really big for us um, in keeping animals out of the shelter as well. Um, so that is pretty much, I think, what we have for the presentation, and we'd love to answer some questions. Well, it sounds like you guys are really busy. I'm do really impressed. So we'll take, we have a lot of questions from the audience, by the way, so we'll go on ahead okay. and jump right in. What was the program called that you used to schedule the recheck appointments? It is called Full Slate. It's an online it scheduling system. Could you repeat that, Jody? Yes. It's called Full Slate. Full Slate, okay. Yes. It's an online scheduling system that you do have to pay an annual membership, but you can sign up for a 30-day free trial. And we have one member or one provider for that website, and we use it all over our shelter from our Pets for Life team to our veterinary clinic or our veterinary rechecks to the fostering program. Excellent. 
Here's the next question. Do you have training uh, required at some frequency for your existing fosters? So, no, we don't. Um, our fosters don't have to go through continued training. Um, I don't know that we got to state just because we were wanting to make sure we got all the information to here that we don't even have really like big orientations. So we've tried like a big orientation and we've tried smaller orientations um, more frequently. And what we have found that works best for us is just one-on-one -on -one training um, with new fosters. Um, and then uh, when we do have maybe additional trainings like our the EKT training I mentioned where the emergency kit and technician where we go into more detail with fluids and um, stuff like that and search feeding, then they can attend those to just maybe further, you know, what they want to learn, but they don't have to do um, like continual training or anything like that. Thank you. Here's the next question. We have a lot of people interested in fostering kittens for us, but do you have suggestions for recruiting fosters for adult cats? One way that we talk to foster families is if they're wanting to get a small litter of kittens and they don't have the time um, to try an adult cat, or if they're just wanting to get their feet wet into the program, suggest an adult cat, because it's really simple for those to be fostered unless they're having to come into your facility for weekly rechecks if they, like I said, they have some type of injury. But always suggest if you have more adult cats than kittens to get the adult cats. Just ask them, like, please take it home. Like, Try to take it home for the weekday. See how it works or take it home for the weekend. And just kind of go from there. Keep encouraging them to let them know that for cats, they're really self-contained. You don't have to do too much with them. And that seems to help a lot. Excellent. Thank you. What is the best database for keeping track of the animals in foster care? And I'll, I'll ha add a second question to that is that I hope that the audience um, is uh, familiar with Maddie's Pet Assistant. And that is a free app. Go to our website and find out all about it. Yeah, so um, so we, I mean, we do use a few, I guess, different programs to completely keep track of everything. So we, um, here at our shelter, use PetPoint um, as our main, you know, animal tracking, um, where we also use the foster module on that to log them out to foster. So we know who's, you know, what animals are in foster with who. Um, but then secondary to that, the program that we spoke of, the full slate, is where we keep track of the rechecks for that. So um, I know there is a module in PetPoint that you can do rechecks for if you don't want to, you know, necessarily, like she said, there is a fee for full slate, which I can, you know, I can see not everybody being able to afford. So, um, you know, there is something in PetPoint. Um, we just, it, you know, sometimes PetPoint can be a little difficult um, to use. So we like the full slate because it's really user friendly um, as far as rechecks. Um, we actually, here at our shelter, we, have the Maddie's pet assistant for the cats and kittens. Um, we haven't started with dogs, but we do have it for our cats and kittens in foster cares. Um, and um, our foster families love it. It's easy for them. They get quick, um, you know, responses to maybe some of the concerns that they have. Um, and it's a good way for us to, to see, you know, what's going on with their fosters without having to ask because the Maddie's pet assistant is already asking that. So um, like I said, a little bit of a combination of what we use, but all of them have been really helpful for us. Thank you, Christina. Do you have palliative care foster program for uh, for adult cats? Um, not necessarily. I be believe you kind of like a, a hospice care type of thing um, is what you're asking. But we don't necessarily. So we like to adopt out uh, most of our animals, um, and we we are big on medical waivers. So if we have um, you know animals that you know, are maybe towards like the end of life, um, we will just adopt them out with a medical waiver, you know, saying maybe whatever illnesses they have um, or, you know, whatever's going on with them or that they are an older cat. Um, and, you know, we'll, we like to just adopt those kind of things out. Um, so we don't necessarily have that program here, but, you know, it, it could be something to start somewhere if you can find the people um, willing to take that on. Thank you. How do you verify the adoptees of kittens that fosters find homes for are valid and legit? Um, so we have just in general our um, our process for adoption and foster care is really like is really open. So even here 
directly at the shelter, we have a very open um, adoption process. So we're not checking like references, like we don't have to go to their house. Um, they kind of, you know, we ask some open-ended questions um, to make sure that some of the animals can be a good fit for them. Um, but we, in general, are, are pretty open. And so it's kind of the same um, when you're empowering your foster families um, to find homes. Uh, I would actually say that they are probably tougher on their adopters than we are here at the shelter because they've cared for that animal for a while. Um, they have lots of feelings for that animal. So they are going to find a good home for them. We've had some that had, like, met a, a potential adopter and then kind of said, mm, you know, I don't really feel like that is the best person for this cat um, because of maybe the, the problems that this cat has. Um, so, you know, it's it's still an open process, so you, we don't necessarily, like, validate them or check into them. But I would say that the fosters um, are kind, kind of do that for you because they have such a bond with the animals that they're adopting out. Thank you. Can you elaborate on the youth programs? Um, yes, actually we can. So we have multiple different programs at our facility um, that our Humane Education works with. So we have ones that are called Teen Club and Shelter Squad. Those are for 13 and up, they or to 18, uh, they come to our facility, they go through training sessions, um, each week with one of our humane educators, and then they will eventually graduate um, to a different program. So we actually start um, at around five years old. They can come in and they do different things um, for the youth groups. What they normally start with is kind of simple humane education, learning about animals and what they need, and going to provide enrichment for the animals. Of course, learning about fostering. Uh, we also do another program called BSI. It's Veterinary Initiative Program, where the, our human educators go into high schools, and we talk to the science department and with the kids, and they eventually will come here for field trips. And that's when, they again, they graduate like that class. Um, another thing I know that one question was about the badges. I saw that in the Q&A, but I'm not quite sure exactly which badge it is. It might just be a human educator badge that they receive. Thank you. Here's the next one. How many foster coordinators do you have in total, and how is the work split up? So um, as far as foster coordinators, it is just Jody and I that are the foster coordinators. Um, but I guess it's to maybe specify what we do and what other people in the shelter do. So we are the ones who are um, kind of – our day starts off with um, identifying the animals that need to go to foster We make sure we know what's out there in the shelter um, and what needs to go. And then we are spending, you know, the time finding the foster homes for them and then sending them out. So we will do the initial send out of the fosters. Um, when it comes to rechecks, um, we actually have a, a specific staff member who does our foster recheck. Um, and so they do that specifically where we don't have to be a part of that. Um, you know, and I know some places the, the foster coordinator is doing all of that where they're giving the vaccines for the foster rechecks and all of that. So. Um, we get to spend most of our time finding those homes for the animals. Um, and then, like I said, we do the initial send out um, so that the foster parents are familiar with us. Um, and that's kind of how um, we spend our day. Um, but it is just Jody and I. And we kind of, we don't necessarily split up the work specifically. So we're kind of both doing the same things that we know. We kind of really work uh, really well together. We know which one's doing what type of thing. But it's not split up like specifically. So. Okay, here's the next question. Our cat adoption rate is very low, and fosters get tired of keeping the kittens and the cats for months. How to get more, faster cat adoptions? Something in the past that we've done and that we're currently doing is our cat's for adoption fee is currently 25. Um, we in the past have, so to speak, stocked up on cats because we've had so many and they weren't getting adopted. Um, in the past, we've also done free adoption events. I know it sounds scary, guys, but it does work. Um, with that, it does help a lot um, to get them out. Um, another thing is just posting them on Facebook. Post them. Do little cat stories. Talk to them and dress them up if you can. Um, anything like that just to get them out. Um, we also have a foster program or a foster parent that has an, her own website that she has dedicated to all of the shelters in our low country, and it's called Adopt at Charles, 
Cats Charleston, if you want to look it up. Um, and she promotes all of the cats that we have on her website and Facebook page. I, I'm going to add, I think it's probably important that, um, you know, your, I, your fosters are also helping look for that home. So, you know, at the shelter, I'm sure you're busy. Um, so I don't know if you, you didn't necessarily, you're spending all the time looking for the rooms, but the fosters should also be helping, you know, a lot of them post on like the Facebook page just for their neighborhoods um, and stuff like that to help um, get those animals adopted. So definitely empowering them to help find that home um, and being the person and not necessarily the shelter, I think would help. Those are some great suggestions. Here's the next question. When you're speaking with new fosters, are you clear about the need for multiple recheck visits? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we'll let them know when they're when they come in um, and pick up the animal that you know this, this if it's a let's say it's an older kitten that just needs to become that like, comes in for like weight checks and um, vaccines, and we'll say this animal we're going to see every two weeks, um, and we'll you know we're going to monitor its weight, and when it gets close to weight for surgery then we'll schedule the surgery. So we definitely let them know. And then if it's a younger kid and it needs to be weekly, we'll definitely let them know, you know, that they need to come in weekly. And so we make sure that they know that. Um, and we, like here, we are open seven days a week, but our veterinarians are only here Monday through Friday. So we're also very clear that if it's something that's going on with their animal and it needs to be seen by a veterinarian, um, that, that is going to be a recheck during the week and not necessarily one um, where just like it's just a normal update or something on the weekend. So. In our okay. foster manuals, um, on the first or second page, you'll also see where it talks to the foster parents, like, are you a foster candidate? And it tells them when they need to come in and how often the care is. So you can take a look at that in the resources and see if that might help you out as well. The resources are in the green file widget at the bottom of your screen. Losing a foster kitten is not only hard on the foster family, but our small group in general. I have eight foster homes currently with 51 fosters. How do you pick up the spirits when some, something sad happens? Sure. So that, I mean, it's definitely sad. You know, it happens, um, unfortunately, everywhere. Um, one good resource has been, I think, that Facebook group that's specifically for our foster families, um, like Jody mentioned earlier, because they are a good resource for each other. Um, they can lean on each other when something happens. Um, you know, to where they they can talk about it and get through it together. You know, and a lot of them have been through stuff similar. Um, so that's, uh, you know, it's been good for us. We also recently started with, uh, we learned from another shelter, uh, we have a little, I guess they're like little grief kits. Um, and it's just a little bag and it has some tissues in it and some chocolate. Um, and it has a little card that has a rainbow bridge um, poem on it as well. And that's been really sweet and people appreciate it. But, you know, the main thing that we tell our fosters when something's sad, you know, it doesn't make it better, but I think reassuring them that it, it's not necessarily their fault. You know, the kittens, it happens, unfortunately. Um, and just reassuring them that we're not mad at them. We're not going to kick them out of our foster program because they lost a kitten or anything like that. Um, but, you know, it's always going to be hard when you lose an animal, unfortunately. Yes. Okay, well, here's the next question. How often would you recommend for a mom with a litter to see the vet? For a nursing mom and kittens, we see them every two weeks, unless maybe the mom is underweight or if the kittens aren't thriving well. But generally, it's every two weeks unless our veterinarian recommends differently. Okay, great. Do you give printed foster care guides or are they available only online? Um, so we do generally give each new foster family um, one printed, um, but they are also available. Well, I think we were going to make them available online. Um, we do have the option to make them available online, but we personally like to hand them one. Uh, but if you are trying to maybe save on all the paper and everything, then you you know it's definitely something that you can make available online and maybe just hand them a little like half sheet that has where to find that manual at. Um, but generally, we do print one out just so that they have one handy. Okay, great. Um, these manuals that are available in your resources, if you don't have time to print them today, they are also on our website um, under this uh, Adult Cat and Kitten Foster webpage. So 
My shelter is in a rural location, which makes it, makes it difficult to rec re recruit fosters. Any further recommendations on how to recruit in a small town? So what I would suggest is doing a community event, or if there's already community events, or a church group, yard sales, anything like that, go out, have a little booth, bring your kittens, bring, if you have puppies, bring those too. Um, and that way you can talk to them about fostering, give them a little flyer. It helps a lot just by talking to the community. Um, go into, if you can, go into the high school or go to, the, if there's a local college that's in like a neighboring town, but most of the people live in yours, just talk to them there. The next question is, have you found uh, that seniors make particularly good fosters or are they a difficult population to manage as fosters? Um, I think that we've probably seen a little of both, honestly. Um, you know, sometimes they can be a little difficult, but sometimes they're not. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really hard. I think it depends on the person specifically, um, because some of them are going to be the ones that are home all the time and can spend a lot of time with the animals, um, and then some of them may just be set in their ways and how they take care of the animals and not necessarily want to listen to what the shelter's recommendations are. So um, I think it's a little bit of both, honestly, um, and definitely maybe depends on the person specifically. Thank you. What kind of technique or how do you find foster parents for behavior fosters? Um, so, I mean, you know, really our recruitment is kind of the same for everyone. So when we are looking for like a specific behavior foster, um, whether it be cat or dog, um, we may just like post about that specific animal and then when they show interest, um, kind of talk to them more specifically about what its behavior problems are um, and see, you know, if they may still be interested. It, it does definitely take longer to get out a behavior animal rather than one that doesn't have behavior problems. But I think maybe talking to them and reassuring them, you know, about what the behaviors are and that, you know, it can be worked with um, and things like that. And, um, you know, we definitely say that, no matter what, if you take an animal home and it just doesn't work out, then you definitely can just bring it back, you know, no hard feelings, you know, we're not going to be mad at you, but if you, you know, if you try it and it just doesn't work out, then that's perfectly fine. Do you ask that resident pets are current on vaccinations in order for families to foster or feline leukemia, FIV tested for cats? Is there something you would check on or just recommend? We do ask that they are up to date on their vaccinations. Um, we do not require that they are feeling leukemia tested or FIV tested. And the reason for this is because we ask that our foster parents keep the animals separated at least for a 10 to 14 day quarantine period. Um, truly, we want them to be separated at all times, but we do know that that's not always the possibility. Um, we, like I said, we do ask for the veterinarian's information. So if something were to come up, then we could call and ask for those records. But otherwise, no. Here's an interesting one. We seem to have too many fosters who will not return their animals. How do you deal with that? Well, um, I would say, I mean, definitely one of the major things is the rechecks that we put on there um, and, you know, making sure that they already have appointments rather than, like I said, they can easily get lost. Um, but even if they're doing the rechecks and you're still having issues, I mean, we start with kind of just pestering them, calls, like daily, emails. Um, and generally that'll get them at least to respond to us um, to make an appointment or to bring them in. Um, we have, um, we sometimes say, even though maybe we might not actually take further action, but one of the things that we do is in the email say, or in the phone call say, you know, if you don't get back to us, if you don't respond to us or don't return the animals, we, we may need to take further action. Who knows what further action actually is? You know, it's just something that you can say to maybe, you know, light a fire under them and, and get them to bring the animals in. Um, you know, they are signing um, for us. They're signing a specific waiver, too, that's saying that they're going to, you know, bring them back and everything. And we make sure to reiterate that whenever um, they are taking animals out. So um, it can be an issue, but, you know, hopefully if you just pass through them enough, they can still bring them back. As a follow-up to that question, um, do you allow your fosters to adopt, and couldn't they, in that case, adopt the animal? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we do 
you know, we let our fosters adopt. We don't necessarily encourage it because a lot of times I know people think that you can lose your foster homes from that. Um, but honestly, with the kitten ICU that Jody talked about earlier, those are animals that are out technically on the same place where our adoption floor is. And a lot of times those people will want to foster that cat to adopt it. So um, we definitely, you know, it's, it's or it's not necessarily encouraged, but it's, you know, they're allowed to do it. Um, it's fine. They, we actually on kittens um, will give a discount if they do adopt. Um, but that, you know, helps keep them out of the shelter as well. And then like she said, the little funny shirts where it says, proud to be a foster failure. Um, a lot of them love that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we definitely let them adopt if that's something that they want to do. Okay, great. This will be our last question t today, uh, tonight. Um, so here it is. The biggest problem we have is fosters frequently bail before the cat has been adopted, even though we were very careful to explain the process. How do you keep this from happening? Um, well, let's see. So I guess you mean maybe like in the ambassador home, um, they're bailing before they're adopted uh, or before the cat gets adopted. Um, you know, that's, I think that would be, that would, that's a tough one. Um, maybe it depends on why they were there, they were bailing. Is it just because the animal's been there too long? Um, are they going out of town? Um, potentially like on our foster page, um, if like somebody has to go out of town, they can find a, a new foster home by posting that they can't keep it anymore. Um, you know, I haven't really seen that problem here, um, but maybe just, more promotion of the animal will help it get adopted quickly. Um, so I don't, I don't have too much recommendation on that um, other than just, you know, uh, making sure the animal's out there and maybe seeing if they can help you find um, a new foster for the animal before they just were to return it. Excellent. You've both, both done a very good job tonight. Um, that's the end of our presentation. Thanks to Jody and Christina and to all of you for sharing your evening with us. Your opinion is important to us. So please take a moment to fill out the evaluation survey by clicking on the link on your screen. Additionally, the full series of this month's fostering webcasts are available free on demand. For more information, go to www.maddiesfund.org. We would like to invite you all to join Maddie's Pet Forum. This forum is brand new and will officially launch at, launch at the HSUS Animal Care Expo this May. By participating now, you'll not only have the opportunity to connect with others in our field, but also help elevate this topic by sharing your experience and wisdom. Go to www.maddiespetforum.org. Again, thanks for your participation in our webcast tonight, and have a great evening. Good night. <laughs>